Hey guys, uh, welcome to this week's Daniel Company. I accidentally lied to you guys last week. I meant to do um, our urgent education either Friday or Saturday and I just flat ran out of time. So um, I'll be uh, talking on that either tomorrow or Friday, but we are getting into some wild stuff with Daniel. I just want you guys to know uh, we're going to get into some end time stuff. Um, when I started this journey in Daniel, I felt instructed to study Daniel before I studied Revelation because I felt like, um, well, and I've since learned that Daniel is a preview. And then John, I believe, saw more of what Daniel wasn't al allowed to share. Uh, but even John has some stuff that he wasn't allowed to share with us that will be revealed as the end of the age approaches. Um, but we're getting into some crazy stuff. So I'm going to do my best to break it down for you because, I mean, you can ask, you know, um, our hub group. You can ask anyone that's heard me teach. I am line by line. And I find that when you go line by line, things that didn't make sense before or that maybe you piece, could piecemeal together but that you weren't quite clear become very clear. And I think this is really important for end of the age stuff. So we're at Daniel 7, and um, Daniel has a vision of the four beasts. He saw um, four uh, huge beasts come up out of the water or the sea. The first was a lion with eagle's wings. The second was a bear up on one side. The third looked like a leopard, and then the other one was terrifying and had huge iron teeth and trampled uh, their remains beneath its feet. It was different from any of the other uh, beasts and it had 10 horns. And uh, so we went into that last week. Now this week, uh, I want to dive into um, what these things mean and, and try to break down the different nations that are being referred to. So in uh, verse eight of Daniel seven, it says, as I was looking at the horns, suddenly, Another small horn appeared among them. Three of the first horns were torn out by the, by the roots to make room for it. This little horn had eyes like human eyes and a mouth that was boasting arrogantly. Okay, so one thing that I want you to keep in mind when you're reading the book of Daniel is that Daniel is showing how nations are interacting with Israel, with the Jewish people. He had no grid for the church age. He had no idea uh, that there would be 2,000 years from the coming of the Messiah until, you know, um, his second return, uh, approximately, you know, 2,000, give or take a few hundred years. Uh, but he had no grid for this age of grace. And you can see that in the prophetic revelation that he received and the explanations that he received, that it's definitely Israel focused and how these nations are interacting with her. But we also have to remember, and I'm not into re replacement theology, the nation of Israel is very important to God, but we need to remember that Paul said that those that are born again are sons of Abraham. So we are um, the spiritual Israel. We're grafted into the original uh, vine that was the nation of Israel. So all of those that believe in Jesus Christ are considered his saints. Jews must be born again. They, they don't go to heaven just by fact that they're Jewish. You have to be born again. And uh, so keep that in mind that Daniel's perspective and the re revelation he receives is going to be uh, specifically to Israel. But there are, um, not allusions, but there are signposts to us as well in the future. Okay, so that's really important. Uh, Daniel told Nebuchadnezzar, uh, that it is during the reign of the fourth kingdom, this is from chapter two, that God would, quote, set up a kingdom that will never be destroyed or conquered, which he has. Also, he said that the ten toes, the feet of the statue that um, Nebuchadnezzar saw, which, by the way, is just representing world powers, especially those that are anti-Christ in nature, meaning, obviously, Christ hadn't come yet, but uh, anti-God. They're pagan. And it's a world system that was originally established by Nimrod and the Tower of Babel. And then it's just grown from there. 
and uh, and we're living in it today, actually. Um, and so the ten toes and the feet would be a mixture of clay and iron, revealing that these ten nations, because you've got ten horns, ten toes, you've got ten horns in Revelation, that there are ten nations that are going to create an alliance so that they are strengthened uh, as one unit. That is actually the seventh beast out of the sea in Revelation 13. It is not referring to a man. It is a nation. The beast out of the earth is not a false prophet or religious spokesman of the beast of the sea. He is actually the Antichrist that is ruling that final world power, which consists of the ten. So it, it's so crucial to understand the language. You've got four beasts that come out of the water or the sea. You've got a beast that comes out of the sea. It is very clearly speaking of a coalition. And the seven heads are the seven world powers throughout history. I mean, it's all right there. The first one was Egypt. You've got Assyria, Nebuchadnezzar, I mean, uh, Babylon, Medo Persia, uh, Greece, Rome. The seventh one is the one that Daniel is seeing in this vision. It'll be the final superpower that is the most hostile and a culmination of all of the ones in the past specifically. So the only reason that Daniel didn't see Egypt and Assyria is they had already had their heyday. They were already a, a superpower in the past. He's living in the golden head and then in the Medo Persian of the chest and the arms as far as the statue. I also find it very interesting that the beast in the book of Revelation also has a statue which he is able to cause to speak because one of the the poking fun of that the prophets would do with the pagans is your gods are mute they can't talk and uh, so at the end of the age there will be an idol that can speak uh, probably using technology but I don't know I mean if we know that AI exists I mean will people be duped to believe that's a god probably not I think it'll actually be demonically empowered um, but we've got these ten toes, we've got this alliance, but the alliance is very fragile. That's why the clay and the iron, they don't mix. It, it's definitely fragile. And then Daniel's looking at these horn, the horns that are tied to the first beast, which we know is a Roman Empire during John's day. But then we have this other one that is even more scary uh, than that uh, Roman Empire. And he says that a small horn appeared among the ten, and three of the first horns were torn out by the roots to make room for the small horn. Now, this means that a small nation with an insignificant ruler was developing and that it was going to destroy before it three horns to make room for itself. So this is a nation conflict so nations against nations okay so it's going to be an insignificant nation no one's going to see this coming and this nation is going to tear out three to make room so the word make room literally means destroy before it so he's going to get rid of those three make room for itself and then that will leave a coalition of eight nations so seven will submit themselves to this this small horn three will be destroyed. Now, this little horn was unusual. It had eyes like a human, and it had a mouth that was boasting arrogantly. Now, some scholars believe that this little horn right here is referring to Antio Antiochus Epiphanes. And what is happening in the book of Daniel is God is going back and forth. So you have to know the chapters and what's going on in order to be like, okay, this is Antiochus, this is a future little horn, a future ruler. I am not in agreement that this little horn is uh, Antiochus Epiphanes because of some of the language which we'll get into. But also, um, I want to say that a lot of times past historical incidents and prophecy can have dual fulfillment, dual meaning. So you'll see uh, a going back and forth between the little horn that was Antiochus that came out of the kingdom of Greece, and then you have 
um, the little horn that is in the future. So a lot of times they'll interchange even in one prophecy and it can make it difficult. But guys, we got Holy Spirit so we can have him help us interpret the word correctly. So I do not believe it's Antiochus Epiphanes because Antiochus Epiphanes came from the four heads of Alexander's kingdom. He was not a small horn. He was one of his uh, generals and he was um, of the Seleucid dynasty. Uh, so Daniel's looking at these ten horn, horns. They're clearly tied to a revived Roman Empire. And I believe this small horn is the future Antichrist that is described in Revelation chapter 13. Okay, so in uh, verses 9 through 10 it says, I watched as thrones were put in place, and the Ancient One sat down to judge. His clothing was as white as snow, snow, his hair like purest wool. He sat on a fiery throne with wheels of blazing fire, and a river of fire was pouring out, flowing from his presence. Millions of angels ministered to him. Many millions stood to attend him. Then the court began its session, and the books were opened. So it appears that the arrogance and the blasphemy of this little horn, which is what Revelation says the uh, Antichrist, final Antichrist ruler will do, is so um, obnoxious that it elicits a response uh, from Father to call to um, to call a court session. He is in court is convened, and he is going to judge this ruler in a very specific way. So the Ancient of Days is a courtroom scene. And he's taken his place among thrones, which personally, it, it can either be the angelic thrones that he has in place, which is the council in heaven, or it can be the elders of um, the Israelite tribes and the apostles. So I'm not sure. Uh, we do know that there is a heavenly court system in Revelation that consists of 24 elders. I'm not sure who those elders are. Okay, so then Daniel uh, verse 11, it says, I continued to watch because I could hear the little horn's boastful speech. I kept watching until the fourth beast was killed and its body was destroyed by fire. Now, uh, this is important because God views rulers and kingdoms, kings and kingdoms as the same. So he interacts with them uh, as the same because the ruler is the ruler of that kingdom. So that's, that's how it's operating is based on the ruler's uh, will. We know that it cannot be Antiochus Epiphanes here because he did not come from the fourth beast. He came from the leopard or the um, the Greece uh, kingdom, which was uh, started by Alexander the Great. The other three beasts had their authority taken from them, but they were allowed to live a little while longer. Uh, now, this is very interesting. Um, and there's a, a word wealth on this. I did not think to look. Uh, okay, this means a season or a time. So it appears that the the Antichrist or this little horn that subdues these three nations, he allows them to continue for a little bit, for a season. But at some point, he's probably going to completely uh, wipe them away and make them part of his own. Uh, now, in Revelation 19, 20 through 21, it says... And the beast was captured, and with him the false prophet who did mighty miracles on behalf of the beast, miracles that deceived all who, ex who had accepted the mark of the beast and who worshipped his statue. Both the beast and his false prophet were thrown uh, alive into the fiery lake of burning sulfur. Their entire army was killed by the sharp sword that came from the mouth of the one riding the white horse and the vultures that gor all gorged themselves on the dead bodies. So the Antichrist, again, will form a statue and he'll force everyone to worship it and they will have to take the mark of the beast so that they can buy, sell, and trade. Very reminiscent of Nebuchadnezzar's um, golden statue. Now, hang on a second because I just studied Revelation chapter 13 Monday and as I'm studying it, uh, I'm thinking the beast out of the sea is the nation. And the beast out of the earth um, is the um, Antichrist, not his false prophet. But you know what, guys? Looking at this, I may be mistaken. 
And that in Revelation 13, he is referring to both the Antichrist and his nation, and then the beast out of the earth um, might be the false prophet. I just don't know. But it says here very plainly in Revelation 19 that the false prophet did mighty miracles. But then you also have in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 where it says the Antichrist will do a lot of miracles. So I'm going to need to dig into that a little bit more because I don't want to teach in a way that is inaccurate. So we'll just leave that question to stand. Um, because you know what? You got to have integrity. When you're teaching the word, if you see that you might have something a little bit off, it needs to be examined. So I just want to um, point that out because I had forgotten about Revelation 19. Okay, so then back to verses 13 through 14, it says, My vision continued that night, and I saw one like a son of man coming with the clouds of heaven. He approached the ancient one and was led into his presence. He was given authority, honor, and sovereignty over all the nations of the world so that people of every race and nation and language would obey him. His rule is eternal. It will never end. His kingdom will never be destroyed. Okay, so um, this verse to me is not referring to his first coming, to the Lord's first coming, because um, this is in the time of the Antichrist, and we know that when Jesus came, the Antichrist was not ruling. Uh, but look at Acts chapter 1, and then we're going to um, go on over to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. So let's look at Acts chapter 1. And verse 9 through 11. Oh, not on the right page. Okay. Well, if I could get my Bible pages to turn. Okay. <clears throat> After saying these things, he was taken up into a cloud while they were watching, and they could no longer see him. As they strained to see him rising into heaven, two white-robed men suddenly stood among them. Men of Galilee, they said, Why are you standing here staring into heaven? Jesus has been taken from you into heaven, but someday he will return from heaven the same way you saw him go. So he's going to return on the clouds. And here we have, uh, I saw someone like the Son of Man coming with the clouds of heaven. Now, you might be like, well, he's approaching the ancient one. He's led into his presence. Well, here in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, and just know that as the end of the age approaches, we'll see things will become clearer, okay? Um, we're just doing our best to try to, Beth, Beth, we're doing our best to try to figure out these things, which is very important. The Bible talks about the end of the age more than any other topic, which tells me it's very important to know. But in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, we're going to look at verse 24, and we're going to end in verse 26. Okay, it says, now this is post-resurrection. So Jesus, at his coming, those that are dead are resurrected. Those that are alive and remain are transformed. So that's what the, the previous scripture is talking about. And then it says, after that, so after the resurrection, after the Lord gathers us together, the end will come when he will turn the kingdom over to God the Father, having destroyed every ruler and authority and power. For Christ must reign until he humbles all his enemies beneath his feet. And the last enemy to be destroyed is death. Okay, so once it's time for the end, the Lord will gather us as his first fruits, but he's going to present the kingdom because he's now completed it. He's destroyed the Antichrist. He's destroyed his false prophet. He's put the devil in prison for a thousand years. He's presenting a complete kingdom, the very kingdom that was first spoken about in Daniel chapter 2 that will never end, that God is going to form. He presents that to the Father as a completed task. Then he's going to rule with a rod of iron all nations for a thousand years while the enemy is in prison. Now, in Revelation, excuse me, 27 through 10, it says, When the thousand years came to an end, Satan will be let out of prison. He will go out to deceive the nations called Gog and Magog in every corner of the earth. He will gather them together for battle, a mighty armor, army, 
as numberless as sand along the seashore. And I saw them as they went up on the broad plain of the earth and surrounded God's people and the beloved city. But fire from heaven came down on the attacking armies and consumed them. Then the devil who had deceived them was thrown to the fiery lake of burning sulfur, joining the beast and the false prophet, and there they will be tormented day and night forever. I mean, the correlations are stunning on the, the end of the age. I mean, there's so much where Daniel explains in Revelation and Revelation explains what Daniel saw. But what he saw was very troubling. You know, it's not fun to see the destruction of your nation. I mean, I think it's Zechariah that says two thirds of Jews will be killed during this time. So I'm sure Daniel was very grieved. And the, the fourth beast that he saw, I mean, it was just terrifying. And the destruction was unbelievable. I mean, he just couldn't fathom that level of destruction. And so in verse 15, it says, uh, I, Daniel, was troubled by all I had seen, and my visions terrified me. So I approached one of those standing beside the throne. So he's seeing this vision. So he approaches one that's standing beside the throne. He asked him what it meant. He explained to me like this. These four bees represent four kingdoms that will arise from the earth. But in the end, the holy people of the Most High will be given the kingdom, and they will rule forever and ever. Now, this is important to understand. We are kingdom people. So that's referring to us. Now, if the Jews believe in Jesus Christ, it refers to them as well. But we are the kingdom people. And so it's important. And that's an illusion, not an illusion, but a, um, a little preview into uh, the work of Jesus Christ and us being part of the, um, the body of Christ and the sons of Abraham. But Daniel is, he's like, that's great. But that fourth beast, he's very concerned about it. So he says then I wanted to know the true meaning of the fourth beast, the one so different from the others and so terrifying. It had devoured and crushed its victims with iron teeth and bronze claws, trapping their remains beneath its feet. I also asked about the ten horns on the fourth beast's head, and the little horn that came up afterward destroyed three of the other horns. This horn had seemed greater than the others, and it had human eyes and a mouth that was boasting arrogantly. As I watched, this horn was waging war against God's holy people and was defeating them until the ancient one, the Most High, came and judged in favor of his holy people. Then the time arrived for the holy people to take over the kingdom. Uh, in Revelation, I think it's chapter 12, it talks about the nation of Israel giving birth to Jesus Christ, the Messiah. She's represented as a woman. And the dragon tries to destroy the baby. He's not able to. Um, and the woman flees into the wilderness where she's protected. The devil tries to go after her. He can't get to her for about three and a half years. So he turns his attention to her offspring. We're her offspring. The church is her offspring. Christ's followers are. So he can't destroy Israel completely. So he goes after us. So when you see where it says that he was making war against God's holy people and defeating them. Um, now, again, we know that two thirds will be destroyed, but he can't completely destroy the nation. So a remnant will be preserved in the wilderness. So he's going to go after Israel. We know that we know the Antichrist makes a treaty and breaks it uh, midway and then begins to go after the people of Israel. Um, and so he goes after the church. Now, this may be messing with your theology if you believe in a pre-trib rapture, which if you keep going with me and then we get into uh, Revelation later. Um, you'll see why I am not of that mind. Um, but just keep an open mind. We're supposed to study. Like I said, I might be wrong on the beast out of the earth um, being the Antichrist. It may actually be the false prophet. Um, so we just we, we don't need to get dogmatic, especially when it comes to things that John wasn't even able to share with us completely. Uh, that revelation is reserved for uh, the end of the age. So anyway, he's really worried about this this beast. Um, we know that the nation of Israel is going to suffer at its hands. We know that we as grafted in uh, will be also persecuted. Uh, but just know that Israel is front and center in this story. So then it says the angel said the fourth beast is a fourth world power that will rule the earth. It will be different from all of the others. It will devour the whole world, trampling and crushing everything in its path. 
Its ten horns are ten kings who rule that empire. Then another king will arise, different from the other ten, who will subdue three of them. He will defy the Most High and oppress the holy people of the Most High. He will try to change their sacred festivals and laws, and they will be placed under his control for a time, times, and half a time. So we know this is clearly referring to Israel because of the sacred festivals and laws. So here, this uh, little horn is going to make Israel its primary target, which we've seen over and over throughout history. Uh, let's see. Now, I am wondering if the three nations that he makes, like he moves out of the way to make room for himself, are those that oppose him and the other, like, what if the, the ten that are in an alliance resist this little horn? Like, who are you? Like, why, why are you even acting like you're all that? You're an insignificant nation. You're an insignificant ruler. Yet he will be empowered by the dragon according to Revelation. So they will underestimate his power. They'll underestimate his ability. And so once they see the three nations being subdued, the other seven will fall in line. I kind of think that's how it's going to happen because a lot of rulers don't want to just hand over their nation. You know, it's almost like with Hitler, he would take over nations usually by just threatening them. And they saw him as a superpower. And so they would submit to him. So that may be a little bit of the scenario that we see. Now, in verse 26, it says, But then the court will pass judgment, and all his power will be taken away and completely destroyed. Then the sovereignty, power, and greatness of all the kingdoms of her he under heaven will be given to the holy people of the Most High. His kingdom will last forever, and all rulers will serve and obey him. That was the end of the vision. I, Daniel, was terrified by my thoughts, and my face was pale with fear, but I kept these things to myself. So, I mean, none of this is comforting to Daniel, right? He's like, this is crazy. This is, this is going to be bad. Uh, and even though the judgment will be in favor of the people of God, the utter destruction is just unbelievable to him. And, uh, and so, I mean, and then you know, the other thing is he was pre-Christ. So I'm sure this was just terrible things that he saw. And, um, and the fact that it terrified him after living through Nebuchadnezzar and being thrown in a lion's den. It's going to be a little interesting, guys. A little interesting. But listen to this. So the ten horns and stuff. And again, I'll get into this in more detail when we get to the book of Revelation. But in verse 13, that I saw a beast rising up out of the, I'm sorry, chapter 13, verse 1, rising up out of the sea. Now, usually when you see uh, the word sea, it's referring to masses of people or nations. It had seven heads and ten horns with ten crowns on its horns. So this beast is clearly referring to a nation, a coalition. So we've got the ten horns and the ten crowns, which refer to rulers, just like Daniel saw. And the angel said what those are. They're ten kings. The only difference here is this beast has seven heads. Those are the seven past superpowers that were anti-God and pagan in nature, okay? Because then it says, written on each head were names that blasphemed God. Then it says the beast looked like a leopard. It had the feet of a bear, the mouth of a lion. So that's the culmination of Babylon, Greece, and Medo-Persia all in one. So pretty much all the worst traits you can think of and the most antichrist in nature are in this final uh, coalition that is the beast rising up out of the sea and it, this is the fourth one that Daniel saw that terrified him and I, I'll go into the wound uh, healed beyond uh, a, a wound beyond recovery and the beast being healed what I think that is but you know I just I just again when I look at this this is clearly referring to a nation because it's Ten horns. Um, it's not referring to a single person. So I do think the beast of the earth still is the Antichrist. Um, I don't think this is referring to the false prophet. But anyway, I'm still studying Revelation. We'll get into all of that. But it's 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 getting a little interesting. It's getting very very interesting. Uh, next week we'll get into the vision of the ram and the goat, 
this is referring to Antiochus Epiphanes. Okay, so we'll we'll dig into that and see what we come up with. But if you have any questions or anything on this material, I would love to hear it. And again, you know, don't don't shut me down just because I think we're going to be here in uh, tribulation. You know, a lot of people say, well, you know, God wouldn't allow his bride to go through the wrath. Tribulation is not the wrath. Neither the trumpets are not the wrath. The tribulation is not the wrath. And the seals are not the wrath. The bowls are the wrath. And we're not appointed to that. So um, I get into a lot of that. There's a Greek word and, and stuff that is very important that helps with us uh, understanding uh, what's going on at the end of the age. Uh, I've got some teaching, I think, on YouTube on that. But I'll be getting into that, I can pretty much guarantee, as we continue forward. All right, well, I've been up since 5, so I am going to get in my comfy jammies, uh, watch a little bit of TV, and I will see you guys hopefully tomorrow for Urgent Education. Get any questions, put them in the comments, or DM me, and we'll tackle them in our teachings. All right, guys, have a good night.